My name is Brandon Hartung, and I'm a media missionary who travels the world using photography and video to tell the stories of impact those missionaries and ministries are having and inviting others to join in those efforts. Today's episode is sponsored by Gospel Lighthouse Church in Blyville, Arkansas. Services are every Sunday and Wednesday. You can join a service in person or online on YouTube, Facebook, or check out myglc.org. Gospel Lighthouse Church, people are our greatest investment. In today's episode, I'm interviewing missionary Thomas Carpenter. Thomas and his wife Angela are missionaries to the special needs community and have worked with ministries and camps here in the States as well as countries all over the world. He shares some eye-opening stories from his travels and ministry work that you're going to want to hear. How are people with special needs seen and thought of in other countries? How can we best help them and share the gospel with them? Let's jump right into the interview with Thomas and find out. All right, we are joined here in the studio. Well, actually, I'm in my studio, but I'm joined here with Thomas Carpenter, and uh, you are a missionary. I'm going to let you explain what you do because you have so many things, but um, you're a missionary, you and your wife, and and, uh, come from uh, a heritage of missions and your family, and just uh, honored to have you on here and uh, get to talk about some of your favorite stories from the mission field and and you even grew up a little bit on the mission field so i'm excited to yeah touch touch on all of that well uh my name is thomas carpenter my wife's angela and we represent assembly of god world missions uh disability ministry we actually uh, are the team lead for disability ministries uh for agwm and we've been working with people with special needs 25 years and it started out simply 25 years ago, we were asked to come and do uh, a camp for people with disabilities because we were working with children at that time. And we were doing some children's evangelism and, and a pastor, a friend of ours said, hey, we're going to do a camp in Arkansas and Hot Springs for people with special needs. Would you come and would you just do like a kid's crusade uh, service or, you know, do five services and, and uh, like a camp? But sure, we've done camps before. So. My thinking was, yeah, this just filled up another week of our of our uh, evangelistic schedule because an evangelist always tries to fill his schedule up. And, yes, thank you, because that's a that's always a good contact point to meet pastors and and make contacts when you work with uh, different groups. But we found out that working with people with special needs uh, was an incredible thing because I had never heard nor had I ever considered the possibility of someone with Down syndrome giving a message in tongues and someone else across the room giving an interpretation. And I was just I was so amazed because it was done in order. It was done in, in God's timing. Uh, the interpretation was spot on. It was clear on point. And it was just such a uh, Acts 10 moment for me because it was like when Peter went to the house of Cornelius and they were talking among themselves, and they saw Cornelius and the Gentiles speaking in tongues and be uh, moved on by the gifts of the Spirit. They said to themselves, how do we withhold the gospel from these people because they're doing the same thing we're doing? It's the same Spirit. And, and I was like, wow, this is like an untouched group of people because no one's, no one that I know of, I mean, we have some stuff here stateside, and thank you, Jesus, for the Americans with Disability Act and some of the accessibility things they have here. But as you mentioned earlier, uh, I do come from a missions family background, and I can tell you that that in third world countries and developing countries, there's nothing for special needs. They're second class citizens. Uh, they most countries have a shame culture for people with special needs. Uh, many times, special needs are hidden in, in in the back works and the back rooms, and and they're not even allowed out of their house, and they're not allowed the freedoms to do what anybody else can do. And so uh, the Lord just kind of began to lay it upon our heart that whatever we do from now on, we didn't know we were going to be world missionaries at, at any point. Uh, we were just we were just thinking uh, whatever we do, we're going to involve people with special needs because God can move on them too. And it became really evident to us at one point where uh, we were doing a church service and I was telling about this experience at the special needs camp because the first special needs camp Again, turned into a yearly thing, and then we started doing multiple camps with a group called Special Touch, uh, and it's a Assembly God U.S. missions uh, organization, and, and they're doing a great job. And, 
and we started doing three or four or five camps a, a year. And, and it just became part of our, our life. It became our family's vacation. So we, uh, we just began to do that. And, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, we got some opportunities to go overseas. And, of course, being a missionary's kid, that would, yes, you know, give me a chance. <laughs> yeah. Sure, I'm going. And uh, we, we went to an African country in 2012 um, that we asked uh, if we could work with some of the special needs people. My wife is a, is a conference speaker, and she was uh, she had a leadership position in the women's ministries of the Assemblies of God. She was the Arkansas District uh, Women's uh, Director uh, for the, that department. And so she was asked to come and be a special speaker at a ladies' conference in one of these African countries. And uh, so I started talking to the pastor who hosted the, the meeting. I said, what, what do you do about special needs? Do you have any special needs people in the church? Because I didn't see any. And the pastor says, no, we don't, we don't want to do that. We, you know, we've never even considered going to them because, you know, basically they don't have a soul. And it was like, wow, man, that's such a big opportunity. And then by the week after just us talking and we saw some people with special needs and we'd stop and talk to them. And, and, uh, in that country, they could sell things on the side of the road. And so we'd see some of the special needs folks would stop and we bought several different trinkets or, you know, souvenirs from them. And at the end of the week, the pastor, uh, just before we got on the plane, he was helping us unload our suitcases out of the uh, out of the vehicle to check in at the airport. And he said, I have to apologize to you. He said, I didn't take you to the places where the special needs people were or the disabled people were, he called them. And he said, because we didn't want you people from America thinking badly of us Africans for the way we treat our special needs people. And he began to explain, and we eventually went back at one point, and and we were able to see what he was talking about, because it is one particular country. They, it, it's a coastal city that they were in, and we went and we saw, we saw people chained in storage containers, down by the, hmm. down by the docks. These old shipping containers that come off the ships, they were no longer usable for cargo. They would just unload them by the side of the docks and and the people with special needs were put in there and uh, they were thrown food in there during the day and some water and then in the mornings uh, the doors are opened up and the place is sprayed out with a hose they don't unchain the people they just spray it out if they've had any sort of body functions or anything they just spray it off and and throw more food in there and just kind of leave them alone because it's a cursed culture because they think that uh, they've sinned or something in their life or where it's a disease or a, a demon or something that will jump off of them and get on to someone who is whole. And it, it's it's a sad thing to see, but these people were very responsive because you show them any kind of attention or any sort of positive thing, man, they wanted to, they wanted to know, why are you being kind to me? You say, well, because of Jesus. And so that's some of the neat stuff that, you know, uh, we want to change, but those are some of the experiences that, let us know that there are people out there that are so easy to reach that just a simple kindness would say, okay, well, if that's the kind of God you serve, that's the kind of God I want to serve. And so it's basically just the love of Jesus. It's, it's kind of the ministry Jesus would do. I would think, you know, that's where he went to the, he wasn't afraid to touch the leper. He wasn't afraid to go into some of those cultures. And so that's kind of my heart for uh, special needs ministry is that this is what, this is a, a hard field to do because quite honestly, it takes a strong stomach. You you, yeah. you experience smells that a lot of people can't handle. Uh, but Jesus has given us grace and mercy that, that to us, it's, it's like we're sensitive to other smells. We like smells. Uh, it's a good thing, but that the, the bad smells are kind of hidden from us because we kind of see the need that, that has to take place there. And uh, God's just been good. He's opened up doors for us to, to go into some of these places. How do you even approach <clears throat> something like, I mean, what what's your first thought when you, they open a storage container and there's humans tied up in, in there? That just blows my mind. Yeah, we, we have, on our, our display table, when we come to it, go to a church and we, we minister, uh, Angela sets the table up, and I, I don't know if she still puts some of those pictures out 
or not because they're they're really kind of they're breaking. They're hard to see. Yeah, it's just the it, you, the Lord is is gracious to us that maybe we've seen enough of it that um we know how to keep our composure a little bit, but when we leave we get on the van or we get in, in the vehicle and we go to the next place. Uh, most often it's, you know, we're wiping our eyes or we're just very quiet. We don't have to say anything because we just know in our spirit, our spirit is grieved that, that humanity can do that to, to, to some of the sweetest people in the world, really. Uh, you know, people with special needs, they have a sweetheart. You know, they are just, some of them are just, you know, amazingly sweet because some people say, well, you know, they're just missing something. You know, God didn't give them everything he gave everybody else. Well, you know what? A lot of that's true. He didn't give them hatred or anger or, you know, bitterness. He gave them a sweet spirit, a lot of cases. And, and then oftentimes the opposite is true. Sometimes they've been hurt so badly that they, they're angry and they're frustrated and they're, they're bitter and it's, it's hurtful. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I'm just overwhelmed a lot of times and it's, again, it's not the easiest thing to do, but it's the most fulfilling because you're actually performing two things at once. You're bringing some relief and you're bringing some, uh, some hope. And so you're giving them Jesus, but you're also trying to, to help their uh, ability to, uh, reunite with their families maybe, or or have someone just care for them or find someone that would be a caregiver for them or someone that would actually come and take them out of place and bring them into their home, and get them into a church uh, because it, it's, it's added benefit to, to get people with special needs into the church. And I think one of the things it says when you go into a church and you see, even in America, you go into a church and you see people with special needs everywhere. Um, my first feeling is, you know what, this is an accommodating church. These people will welcome anybody. They're not going to look at your skin color. They're not going to look at your disability. They're not going to look at your differences. Uh, that means you're in an exclu- you're, you're in an inclusive church. And so that's what we're looking for. That's what we want the church to be, is really to go out and get those that are uh, not like us and, and have some diversity in our churches that, that you don't mind if, if you have someone with Tourette's that barks out in the middle of a service. Hey, yeah, you know, it's like, you know what? We're supposed to be Pentecostal, right? At least I am. <laughs> and it shouldn't bother me that someone uh, does something in church. You know, that's, who knows? I, I don't even know if, if that might be the Spirit of the Lord coming on them. And they're, you know, that's the only way they know to respond to the Spirit is just have one of those Tourette ticks. You know, it's like, okay, that's their way of, you know, the Spirit just kind of trying to get out of them. So who knows? I, I don't know. I don't know why that that just intrigues me some. But anyway, what uh, what are you? Um, I guess how do you approach? I guess <clears throat> getting um that message and the heart behind what you guys are doing to the American church. I guess trying to get people involved and to do something. Well, uh, when we began to tell special needs stories and that missionaries that's what we need to do we just need to tell our stories yeah that's what this podcast is yeah. all about right here you know we can uh we, we can preach a sermon and i often do and i usually have a text uh when uh when i start presenting a missions message but it's more about the stories and i i, I just make it relevant to what the bible say um uh, but i can i can tell stories and i can tell by reading the crowd that you know, it touches the people. And I think that the ability to tell the stories, especially about special needs, it's easy to touch people's hearts. There's not a service that we go to, and, and we don't purposely do this, but we do we do want to share the bad stuff too because we want people to see the real need behind it. But there's very rarely a service that there's not tears flowing in the service. And it's easy to touch the heart. Sometimes it's just not as easy to touch the pocketbook. And so there's a uh, there's a little bit of difference. They usually be defined with the offerings because people Americans are really good about giving to causes, and and so we we uh, we're not complaining about the cash offerings that come in, the love offerings that come in, um, but 
to go into an American church, if if I could get the American church to see that people with special needs, they're not an inconvenience. There are ways in our churches that we can bring in any disability into the church and they can be a valuable part of the family of God. Because in in my eyes, they're not they're not any different than you or me. They're all made in the image of God. They're all made like him. Uh, so if we could get the American church to to buy in that ministry is not just sitting in your pew. Ministry is maybe when an autistic kid comes in and they have a, a, a sensory overload uh, and they start screaming and, and fussing. There are things you can do that can calm them down and you can give their parents or guardians just a, a respite just a little bit and be their friend. You know, you can't touch them and you can't hug them because a lot of times that's a, uh, they don't like that, but you can be their friend and they can learn to trust you and you can help calm those fears down because when they see that you're calm and it's more than just one or two pers- people around them that's trying to help them, uh, they, they, they can get comfort pretty quickly um, because a lot of times, uh, when someone has a sensory overload like that, they recognize that people are afraid or uh, spooked or whatever the emotion is. Uh, if, if there are people around them enough that just calm, and they can just they can calm down as well, just a little bit too. So the church just needs to be aware that they're out there. Uh, the statistics tells us that uh, one out of every every eight people has a disability, and so. Uh, most of those don't go to church because they're they're afraid they're going to offend somebody by their disability or some some other excuse that they can come up with. So if we can give them the reason to come to church, that they're loved and accepted just as they are, um, we can have people come to know Jesus a lot quicker, I think, because these are our people with special needs. They're ready to hear about Jesus. And again, kindness, they want that kindness. And if we show the love of God to them, they're really, they're, they're really ready to accept. Yeah. So what, what's one of your favorite stories that you tell whenever you're preaching out that, that people respond to and <laughs> share here on the podcast here? Well, uh, one of my favorites is that uh, we were in, in Zambia, uh, in Africa one time, and I'm, I'm six foot four and, and weigh in the neighborhood of 300 pounds big guy and uh we were in Z- western zambia the losi people that are out there they're they're not big they're if you're five seven as a guy that's a you're you're a pretty tall guy for that for a losi and uh, so i remember uh we went out to this village uh called nalalau and it's <clears throat> a beautiful little village just like you'd see in the paintings or the uh, the the videos you'd see of africa just little these little thatch roof huts and it's in a high desert area. It's got a little lake in the village, and and uh, but you can't drink the water because it'll kill you <laughs> badly. And uh, but uh, we we went in there just to uh, share Jesus. And the age the average age, life expectancy in that village was thirty four years old for men, twenty nine for ladies. I, I'm from Arkansas. I've been around poor people all my life. I've never been around starving people before. But that's what we were in. And so uh, anyway, they uh, they they started gathering around us as soon as we pulled our vehicle up in the village. We we're going to sleep in tents or in hammocks and, and make campfires and cook all of our meals for a week. And at night, we're going to have these big bonfires and people will come from all over and we'll tell Bible stories. And we'll act them out. And so I remember that I was 50 years old at the time. It's been about 10 years ago. And so we pull up uh, in this village and this man walks up to me and he's about my age, a little short, low C man, but very dignified. And you can tell um, he was well-educated. He had been to the city and he had learned, you know, how to speak English like the King's English and, and uh, very proper. And he, he walks up to me and he says, uh, I understand that you have a King in your country. And I said, uh, no, sir, we have a president. And he said, oh, no, no, you have a king. Uh, 
at this point, uh, Obama was our president. And so uh, I said, I said, no, we have a president and his name is Barack Obama. And and uh, he said, oh, no, 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 no. I know Barack. I know Obama like he really personally knew. He said, I'm not talking about Obama. I'm talking about Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis is the king. And so yeah. we made a good friendship and and he started calling me Tuna Makua. And so all the people uh, in the village just started, started calling me Tuna Makua. And I didn't know what that meant. And so anyway, uh, I asked one of our interpreters, I said, what, what do they mean when they say Tuna Makua? And the interpreter said, oh, he's calling you the great white man. And I'm like, hey, I can identify with that. It's pretty cool. And then the other interpreter said, well, he's actually calling you like the fat white man. I said, well, I, well, that, and so, yeah, but it's still uh, a endearing uh, title because fat there is, is healthy. That's what it means. It's yeah. Healthy. And you had, if the shoe barely fits. Yeah. <laughs> you've had, uh, you've had a lot of good food and you're healthy. And, and so that was my name. And, and really it was an amazing time there. And I remember that uh, the missionary that we're with gave us a box of Bible, just 36 Bibles. And we're talking about a village. The surrounding area was about 3,600 people. So it was basically one Bible for every hundred people. And so the missionary had told us, said, don't, don't get these Bibles away. You have to barter for them. This, this tribe is used to bartering for things that if you start giving them away, that everyone's going to want one. And we'll have a riot on our hands. Uh, so make them trade you something. So I'm like, okay, pretty cool. And so the first person that came, we didn't even advertise that we had Bible. We were just telling simple Bible stories. And Elvis came to me because that was the chief's name. That's why I said, uh, you have a you have a king in your country named Elvis. My name is Elvis, and I'm king here. That's why the chief of the wow. Bible introduced himself. And so Elvis came to me. Uh, one day and he brought an axe. I mean, it's it's a billy club axe. I mean, it's got a big head on the back side of it and a big sharp edge on the other side. And, and uh, it's a war axe. It's something they used to use for centuries just in their tribal wars. But it, yet for them, it was uh, their, their tool of the trade because that village was on the river and they could sell charcoal to the desert area that didn't have a river, didn't have any trees or vegetation. They would make charcoal and then take it three or four days walk into the desert and, and barter their charcoal for other goods. So Elvis gave me an ax for a Bible. And it was such an amazing thing when I began to realize he just gave me the tool of his trade, like a farmer giving his tractor away or a writer giving away his computer. It's like, wow, this is a sacrifice. And I asked the missionary if I could have that ax. He said, oh, yeah, I've got a barn full of those. Take it. You know, I'm like, yeah, you got a barn full, but you don't have Elvis's ax. You don't have yeah. Chief's ax, you know. And so I was able to get that. But it was just a few minutes later because people began to line up after he, he began to trade. And they were trading garden hose and they were trading uh, length of water hose and rakes and little hand tools hammers whatever for bibles but this man walks up to me and, and he said tuna makua i don't have anything to trade all i have of value to my name is my wooden leg and he sat down on the ground and he started trying to undo this wooden leg that was like from the knee down it was held on with strips of inner tube and he began to untie that inner tube around his wooden leg and was going to trade him and to see what that man was willing to give up, just to hear the word of God, just to have a copy of the word of God. And so we just took up a little offering right there among us missionaries. And, and we came up with enough money to, to cover the cost of that little Bible. It was just $3.40. And uh, we gave that man a Bible. And the last I saw of that man, I never saw him again. Uh, that was like three days before we left. I never saw him again, but the last I saw of him, he was carrying a cellophane wrapped Bible and kissing it as he walked through the brush and walked out of sight. And people are hungry for the word of God. They're just wanting to hear the word of God. People who've never heard the word of God or the love of God, 
Um, once it's once it's experienced for them, they want to hear it. They want, it. and so to me, I, I that's that scene is indelibly marked in my brain. How much that we take the word of God here for granted, and and people around the world they want the word of God, and so for me to be able to go and pass out Bibles in Zambia or or go to uh, to India and and hear some of the stories of persecution of of uh, you know we think Muslims are, are terroristic. I'm telling you, some of the Hindus uh, make the Islamics look uh, like fire boys sometimes. That's what they'll do. And uh, even to their own people. And uh, really, really a, a terrible, terrible thing. And hear the, the stories of these beautiful people that come to know Jesus in the midst of some of the most fierce persecution you've ever seen. They come to know Jesus <coughs> and they still have a sweet spirit about it. I can tell you, Brandon, you know me. I don't necessarily always have the sweetest of spirits. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> you know, I, I've got to, I got a lot of work to do on my spirit sometimes because sometimes I get aggravated and, and get, get crossways even myself. And, um, but to see just a love and a peace of God come on some of these people who've been through some of the persecutions. And, and so, uh, there's so many stories that, that just are coming to mind and, and, uh, I don't have time to tell them all, and I, I, I really can't tell them all. But um, just know that, that the Lord is really doing a work among people with special needs all over the world. Angela and I have been to every continent except Australia right now, and our Antarctica. But there are no human inhabitants except in laboratories down there. So scientists, yeah, <laughs> the only ones that live down there. Uh, and so maybe one day we'll witness to them, but. Uh, we'd like to go to Australia one day, but, but going to the different continents and being international missionaries and being invited by missionaries that are on the ground there to come in and work specifically or to teach and train how to integrate people with special needs into the churches and schools and, and in communities, uh, that's that's our calling because uh, it's the world's largest unreached people group right now. 1.3 billion people in the world have a significant disability or special need. And when you put that into... Uh, the big picture of things, it's like the whole continent of Africa is 1.3 billion people. That's how many people are in the world with special needs. So that's that's kind of our heart. we got a big, big job to do, and there's not many of us doing it. You're telling me about um, another place um, you're, you've been before and getting ready to go again, hmm. about how kind of they view um, people with special needs as not really even human i guess the place in africa is could be considered that as well yeah but uh tell tell us about what it looks like um in this other country that you've been to no we can't talk about specifics but um i I can tell you that is a muslim communist country and they're very strict on who they allow in it's a very sensitive country i i make the joke that it's one of those unique countries unique in and unique out because, yeah, yeah, you know, <clears throat> when we arrived uh, last October, we went to this country. Uh, a man uh, from our team and I went. We didn't take the ladies because it's just too rough. You know, it's just, and we didn't know what we we're going to get into. We knew it was going to be a very rough trip. And uh, and, and I, I'm a veteran. The man who went with me was is a former. Well, he's a former marine, I guess. Who knows that saying? The former marine. But anyway. Uh, they wanted people who were veterans to go because at least we know kind of handle our how we can handle ourselves and things like that if things got physical or if we were arrested and you know things like that. If we were caught without our paperwork, um, it was going to be a ten thousand dollar fine minimum or ten years in jail. Uh, I mean, they were very strict on on what you could do. So we knew we knew the threat was there, and as soon as we got to the airport. And we showed our passports for entry. Uh, the man who picked us up at the airport told us as we got in the car, he began to explain the thing. He said, now, when you turn in your passport, you won't notice that you're being followed, but you're going to be watched all the time. They know you're in country. 
They know you're American. They know you're a Christian because you're automatically a Christian if you're from America. <laughs> That's their idea. And uh, so they're going to watch you. They're going to make sure that you do things exactly the right way. And if they see you do anything anywhere out of order, you know, they're going to they're going to stop you. And so never go anywhere unless you have someone from our place with you at all times, because they know the system and they know a lot of these guys. And so basically uh, he drove us to our uh, motel not a motel room, it was an apartment that they had for us on the fifth floor, no elevators. We had to carry all of our luggage, all of our equipment upstairs. And um, so we were there from from basically six o'clock in the evening to nine o'clock the next morning. They'd pick us up and then they would take us to this transition center where they would uh, introduce us to individuals who were taken out of institutions. In this particular country, if you're born with any sort of uh, disability at all you could your eyes could be crossed your your you know cleft palate or club foot or even slow in school uh dyslexia or or uh, any any sort of things that that are hindrances but not necessarily disabilities uh you're you're labeled with a disability and your humanity was basically taken away from you and, and in that system uh it, it's a very poor country and everybody has to work because it's a communist system but if, if someone with a special need is born into your family, then someone has to not work and they have to take care of this special needs person, even though they can do everything for themselves. Somebody has to be with them 24 seven. And so uh, what we were doing, we're working with a missionary that was there. And um, these guys have been there for 40 years and it, under persecution the whole time. And, uh, They've been working with special needs for the last 20 years because it, it just hit them in the face. And they realized they had to do something. So they started this transition center, which is more like a boat tech school, where they take the people out of these institutions and they teach them a trade. Uh, agriculture, beekeeping, cosmetology, uh, culinary, welding, art, jewelry making, silk worker. There's 30 different things that they could do. Instrument making is amazing stuff. And they're teaching them a skill. And it takes them three years to complete the course. And then they have to go and present themselves to the government. I like in the Old Testament, the New Testament day, where if Jesus were to heal a leper or somebody, he'd say, okay, now go show yourself to the priest. And they have to verify that you're clean. Same sort of system because basically the same kind of people. And so um, what happened was uh, they would complete the program and then they would go to the government official and he would have to clear them or a humanity card, and they would get an identification card that would say, even though I have a special need, I have a certification that I'm qualified, even for things such, such as simple as um, selling their own homegrown vegetables out of their garden on the side of the road. It's just that the labels that were put on people with special needs, so it's a very uh, unappreciated culture, and so we're going in there, and we're we're teaching and training how to integrate these these young people, uh, mostly young people, into their communities, even back into their own families. Because most of the time, the families can't afford to keep them, so they turn them into the institution. But once they come to the transition center and they they get their degree and they, they can go back to their homes, and all of a sudden, they're a viable part of the family again. And, and the reunion of some of these families has been such an amazing thing. Because, again, we're talking about a Muslim context country. And you know that in most Muslim context countries where uh, someone becomes a Christian, they're excommunicated, they're kicked out, they're disowned. That's the best case. Yeah. In this country, because of what's going on, the, the beauty of it is that these families are taken in, these Christian young people now, because in this transition center, where they come to, again, they're shown the love of Jesus. They have chapel five days a week, and uh, they uh, they they work in a Christian atmosphere, and they're brought in, and it's such a wonderful thing to see that here are these Muslim families who are being reunited with a Christian person with a special need, and these Christian young people are winning their families to Jesus, and there's testimony after testimony of how 
this has worked in reverse where uh, this family who has had a child and had to give it up and yet be reunited with the family 30 and 40 years later. And it's such a, oh, I've missed my child. You know, these old Muslim uh, mamas and daddies and even grandparents, they're welcoming back their their child that was taken away from them. They never had the opportunity opportunity to learn who they were or anything about them. And now all of a sudden they're being reunited and they're winning their families for Jesus. And it's such an amazing thing to see. And, uh, but yet the persecution that this place is under, uh, I give you the short version. There, there's so many things to say about this place. We're going to go back hopefully later on in the year. Uh, they want to do a camp for special needs and they, they want to do a camp for a hundred people in yurts up in the mountains. Now, that's a big task because we we certainly don't take our, our special needs folks uh, in tents, this bigger group here in the States. It would just be a logistics nightmare. Uh, but they, that's what they want to do. So we're going to try to go uh, sometime in the very near future and, and use their compound just to show kind of how we can do it and then uh, eventually transition them and their leadership into being able to do what we do. And uh, we'll just kind of step back at that point and say, okay, here's your ministry. Because when the nationals take over, it makes it much more effective than if, you know, somebody from the outside yeah. is trying to do it. We want to, we want to make sure that, that uh, we give them ownership in this. This is their, this is their baby. We're just consultants, you know, kind of thing. Uh, but it's exciting to, to be able to go back and, and, and do this. But uh, in 2022, uh, the government came in and they basically took many of the staff and some of the students at this school and relocated them all over the country, trying to do what this transition center is doing. They wanted to do it in a Muslim context because they didn't want the Christians out doing the Muslims. So what happened was they, they figured out that, duh, Allah can't do what Jesus can do. You can't do the same stuff in Islam that you can do with Christianity because you have the power of the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you and, and the supernatural taking over. Because uh, a lot of our things in Christianity, it doesn't work without the supernatural. And uh, so anyway, what they did, instead of sending them back to the transition center at first, they, they dispersed them all over the country back into the institutions. And so you have these very qualified individuals, these very educated now individuals who could do a lot of things. They've been put back in institutions and basically, again, some of the gross stuff. I mean, no care, no food, no no toiletries, no, you know, nothing. Uh, and so for a long time, it was a very big concern. Well, after a, over a year of prayer, over a year of, of the staff and us praying, Lord, would you bring these people back to where they need to be? Uh the Lord just started working it out. And that as last I heard four or five of the, uh, of those who were kidnapped have come back to the institution. Several more have been taken out of the institutions and uh, given back to their families. And that's where they were seeing the families being led back to Jesus or led to Jesus. Um, but the same government official that came in and, and basically kidnapped those people out of the transition center, uh, been about two years now he came back and i think it was february we saw the video of him going through the transition center giving out certificates of excellence to the transition center and he told our missionaries who have been under persecution for 40 years he said i want you to start 40 new transition centers across our country one in every major city wow and I'm thinking the first time I heard that, the first time I heard him say that, we had somebody interpreting as we saw the video. It's like, okay, our missionaries that have been there diligently and under very hard persecution. And I can't give you their war story because it's their story to tell. Uh, but 40 years of persecution, and now they're asked to open up 40 transition centers. Huh. One for every year that they were persecuted. Yeah. That's, that's God. Man. That's well, it. and you just think 
too. I mean, there's oh, so many examples, but just 40 years are probably, uh, again, I don't know their story, but probably a lot of going, are we making a big enough impact God? Like, what are we doing? Like 40 years. And then all in a, in a moment, God yeah, I, used I, it and turned it all around. I will even tell you this, that, that the man, the husband, uh, was exiled from the country for five years, and the wife had to stay in country for five years by herself. I'm, wow. We're talking about that kind of persecution. Yeah. From this government. Goodness. And now it's like, boom, here they are, retirement age almost. It's like, okay, Lord, you've asked us to do 40 times more than what we've done, you know, but <laughs> but now they have the government's approval. And so, yeah, uh, it's all those seeds they've planted over time. And, and and it's being faithful, man. Ugh. It is. It's working with the disability community, which every country in the world is wondering, what do we do with our people with special needs? And if we have people going into these countries that will be special needs specific, we're able to get into countries like this because everyone wants to know, everybody wants to know what to do with special needs people. It's, it, it's an issue everywhere. I'm not going to say problem. It's not a problem. It's an issue. And so... If we can get in there, we're able to get in a Muslim country like this because of special needs ministry and it's changing the government for that Muslim context government to come in to a Christian thing and give certificates of excellence. We're talking 98% of the country is, is Muslim. Yeah. It's a miracle. Like, Woo, come on, Lord. You're changing yeah. countries. You're changing governments through special needs ministry. So anyway, we're excited about stuff like that. And, and we don't we don't know exactly the dates we're going back, and I probably couldn't tell you because, again, once we fill out our visas, they're going to be watching us. They're going to be keeping up, yeah, tracking us. And so, uh, it's it's really kind of it's kind of neat, you know. It's kind of like, you know, the saint kind of oh, you the uh, the old program, the saint kind of reminds me of that, a double up seven kind of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> you know, kind of yeah, stuff, so. Well, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and I, I kind of just sent you a message last night, but um, I know it won't be hard for you to talk about is, again, the, your heritage of missions and your, your family. And mm -hmm. and uh, your dad was a missionary and mom and, and you and your sister, I believe, yeah. were kids on the missions field, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, just tell us a little bit about... Um, how you grew up and watching your dad and mom and, and, uh, actually your dad, uh, for anybody watching that doesn't know, he, he recently passed away and, yeah. and got to enjoy his, uh, um, reward of all his hard work. But, um, I actually talked to him before about, uh, coming on this podcast <laughs> and he decided to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to turn me down and then go ahead and, uh, hang out with Jesus instead. Yeah, uh, but he, he's a uh, he's one of my uh, heroes of the faith, and and just uh, so many cool stories. I'm sure you can tell from him. But um, if you want to tell any stories of his that he always told, and and um, uh, that sticks with you, uh, I'd love to hear it. And I know other people would love to hear them. And yeah, I'll, I'll just tell uh, from my perspective. Uh, okay, nobody could tell stories like my dad. I mean, he was the storyteller, storyteller. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if you ever knew them, you, you you know what I'm talking about. But my first memories of life were of Mission Field. We were in British Honduras at the time. Now it's called Belize. Belize now is kind of a tourist area, and everybody goes there for tourism. But uh, when we were there, we went, uh, I think, January of 1966. I think the 17th is when we landed on the ground. And uh, we, uh, I was 11 months old. I was just four when we came back uh, that first time. <clears throat> but my first memories of life were there. And I remember uh, back then, Belize was uh, was the second poorest country in all of Latin America. Only Haiti was, was a poorer country at that point. And so um, it, was, it was hard. Uh, I watched my mom and dad uh, really struggle with things. Um, but they loved it. They thrived at it. And and my parents were, were, the, were the best missionaries because they weren't afraid to go anywhere. We've got pictures of, of uh, my mom, who uh, she 
when she came back to the States, everybody thought, oh, she's such a lovely lady. She's so prim and proper. But <laughs> you get her behind the wheel of a uh, four-wheel drive British Land Rover, and she went through places that would scare most people. Uh, and we've got a picture of my dad with a machete walking through the jungle, cutting, cutting things out to make a road for my mom to drive the Land Rover loaded with equipment. And my sister and I in the Land Rover driving over the fresh road that my dad had just cut through the jungle to villages that had only footpaths in there to the jump to, to their village. And we would go in there and we would uh, break out these uh, the, these old speakers and, and microphones, simple PA system and and share the gospel. And and uh, Belize is a tropical country. And, and you've been there uh, multiple times and, and you're in and out of Central America. You know about those. Uh, all of a sudden showers that pop up. And mm -hmm. I remember uh, you, you, you're in a service and the rain start and they're sitting on logs or sitting on these simple stools and people don't get even get up. They're just used to the rain. They just sit in the rain and listen to the gospel. And, and I remember uh, seeing this all my life. I remember going into villages. And back then I was blonde headed and I'm blue eyed. And everybody thought that uh, I was sick because my my sister was blonde as well. And, and they thought we were sick and our hair was falling out because we were blonde headed. And they thought we were blind because we had blue eyes. And so they'd wave their hands in front of our face. And uh, so I remember being freaked out as a little kid. These people always wanted to touch my eyes and touch my hair um, <laughs> because we were different. We were the first white kids into a lot of these villages. And... Uh, one of those villages is a little city of Hopkins, and we used to go there quite often, and we'd have to get in these uh, dugout canoes called dories, and, and they're like 40 feet long, made out of a single log, and, and sometimes they leak quite a bit. You had two guys paddling, and one guy uh, bailing water, and you have three other people in there trying to get to the other side over to Hopkins, and we would have services there, and I remember uh, the pastor there, Brother Zuniga, uh, he he had the biggest toothless grin you've ever seen in your life. And he was a Garifuna man who can trace his lineage straight back to an African culture. And, uh, but just a friendly, loving man of God. He loved us. Even though we were different, we were the first white people he had ever seen, but he loved Jesus. And, um, that was a little, uh, village of Hopkins. And again, we we're the first white kids in there today. If you go to Hopkins, Belize, it's one of the stops where some of the cruise ships go into and you got white people everywhere. You got white shop owners and Chinese. I mean, we were the only white people that had ever been to that place. Uh, and so that's a neat thing. And, and we, we think about uh, these, this road that I was talking about where dad cut it and mom drove. That's up in the North part of, of Belize. <laughs> and that's heading into the, the, the village of San Jose. And San Jose is now a thriving village. It's a, it's one of the bigger towns, grocery stores, all sorts of gas stations and everything in there now. And the road, the original road cut in there was cut by my dad with a machete. And they just kept the road cleared out. So, so cars could get in and out after that point. And that's such a neat thing that it's a highway now. It's a paved road now that my dad had cut and he, he brought the gospel to that place but never heard about Jesus. And, and so, uh, when I came back, uh, to the States at age four, uh, my dad was so sick with hepatitis, uh, for six months, basically he was in a bed and we didn't know if he was going to live or die. He was in there. He was so sick. We couldn't go into his room. We'd have to stand in the doorway and just look at dad and say, you know, we love you, dad, or, you know, daddy, we, you know, we want to hug you. No, you can't come in here. You can't, you, you, you stay out there. And, uh, so he comes back to the States and, and, uh, he can't get cleared to go back to the field because of, of the hepatitis. And my dad for years, uh, just felt like, and my mom too, uh, my mom loved missions work as much as my dad, if not more. She's the one that always said, Hey, we got to go back. We got, and now I can't go. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Lord will heal you enough. We can go back, and we would go back on occasion, uh, you know, just to go back in the country for short visits, but couldn't stay. Uh, Dad began to pastor and, and do other leadership things, uh, 
at that point, but uh, they always had the desire to go back. And uh, I remember coming back to the States and, and meeting some other missionary kids and we'd do a little missionary kid fellowship thing. And, and I would listen to other missionary kids talk about what their dads, you know, or what their families did on the mission field. And I remember one of my best friends, I'm, I'm talking with him one day and, oh, we're about 10 or 12 years old. And uh, I listened to what his dad did as a missionary. And he said, oh, my dad sits in an office in, in Bangkok, Thailand, and he just edits video. You know, that's that's what he does. And he has a TV pro- program that he does in Thai. And I looked at him, I'm like, yeah, you're not a real missionary. <laughs> you're not a missionary kid. You've never had to go barefoot through the jungle and you've never had to, you know, go kill snakes out of your chicken house and you've never had to do all these other things, this rough experiences. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I was the original jungle boy and, and you know, I was. It was really kind of different. It was it was rough. Uh where, where my parents are missionaries, it was rough. And some I didn't think some missionary kids had it that rough, but uh because it was it was a very difficult time and very difficult season. Uh, but my dad was always faithful. Uh, and there, there were situations that, that my dad had to do uh, that really were hard for him. They're on the mission field. And my mom passed away in 2011. My dad found himself uh, retired uh, from from the Arkansas district uh, office. He was the district secretary treasurer and as well as the uh, missions director. He retired at uh, age 72. And then my mom was killed about six months after dad had retired. And dad found himself just lost. Like, what am I going to do? And, you know, and, and he he was preaching different places and he was teaching and he was uh, doing Bible studies and stuff like that. And, and uh, he just, he, he was just lost. And he, he was in a, uh, a period where he needed something. And so uh, one of the people in Springfield, Missouri called dad, said, Brother Carpenter, uh, you're still listed as an active missionary. Uh, he said, would you be interested in a short-term missions abroad program that we have? And dad was like, oh, yes, I would. That would that would be very interesting. And, and uh, so dad came up to Springfield, Missouri and interviewed and this young guy, I was across the desk from dad and said, here, we're wanting to, uh, we're, we're wanting some veteran missionaries to go and teach in some Bible colleges around. And he said, well, the one that was kind of most desperate is that we would like someone to go to Belize and, and, uh, and, and teach at the, at the Bible college in Belize city. And my dad named the name of the Bible college. And the guy says, well, yeah, you know, that school. He said, <laughs> He said, I touch every block on that campus as I helped build those buildings on that campus. I helped start that Bible college in 1966. He said, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine a better place to go. And uh, so the, the man uh, said, well, when can I have your answer? Dad said, give me two days and my bags will be packed and I'll be ready to go. And when when he told us kids, hey, I'm going back to Belize, I think all three of us were just like, wow, dude, you got to. This is this is God. You yeah. felt like you haven't completed the work for all these years. We're talking about the hand of God leading you from 1970. That's when we had to come back. 1970 to 2012. Wow. That's a long time to be wanting to go back to do a work and to complete a job you hadn't been able to complete before. But that, it was so merciful that when he went back to Belize that uh, everybody still knew him. We went back with Dad uh, in 2012. We, uh, My sister I was on that trip. <laughs> yeah, there, you were there. Yep, yep. And, and so we went, and you can vouch, everybody knew him. Everybody still knew him. We went to that church in Dan Griga and, and Faith Assembly. Again, that's the church that he built. And we walked into the back of the church and and the pastor of the church 
uh, stopped what he was doing. He said, how many of you remember a missionary, a young missionary family, uh, Tommy Carpenter, uh, and, and his family that were here as missionaries back in the 60s, and almost every hand went up, you know, because if they didn't know us personally, they had heard the stories. And uh, it was like, well, they just walked in the back of the church, and and uh, they're here today. And people started clapping because they remembered the work that Dad had started. And uh, just a few highlights of what he did in Belize, and again, <laughs> Uh, I could tell my dad's stories on the, all day, I think. But uh, two things that he did on his uh, first missionary trip from 66 to, uh, to I think, December of 69, actually, in January of 70, he went back uh, to kind of clean up, pick up, and load up and come back. Um, two things he started. The Bible school, they used International Correspondence Institute. He and, and one other uh, missionary couple in, in Central America, they were the first people to use the ICI curriculum. Today it's called Global University. And it's a big deal up here in Springfield. That's They have their own building. It's, it's like 12 stories high. They have their lots and lots of uh, writers and lots and lots of uh, professors in there writing curriculums and stuff. And dad was one of the pilot missionaries to try that out. He, they, they did that there in, in the Bibles College there in Belize City. And another thing that he was the first to do in, in Central America was uh, a, a teenage program to try to help raise teenage missionaries and, and get them integrated into a miss, missionary culture and try to get them a missionary vision. It was called AIM, Ambassadors and Mission. And dad was the host for the first ambassador and mission program, 1967. And um, when you, when you consider those, those two things, they used him and his leadership skills and his people skills to be the guy they would send the pilot programs to and see if it would work. And they're still going today because of the quality of, of dad's leadership there during that time. Those are those are two things you just kind of go, wow, you know, that was some pretty influential stuff. And yeah. but anyway, uh, yeah, I'm I'm proud of the work that my my mom and dad did there. Uh, I remember a couple of stories from when we were on that trip. Uh, one was going to a church in Lucky Strike, and uh, just how that I don't remember was the church or the name of the whole village. Was it the name of the whole village Lucky Strike? Yes, it's it's Lucky Strike Village. It's it's right, uh, it's just right outside of the Maya ruins of Alton Ha, mm -hmm. and Lucky Strike uh, was jungle. It was just a jungle thing. And back in the fifties, uh, the only way to get from place to place, uh, these seaplanes would go because it's a lot of water. It's right there on the coast, and and a lot of Belize or a lot of British Honduras are the islands, the keys that are outside of of the mainland. <laughs> so you have these little. Uh, these little planes that go from airstrip to airstrip. And uh, I guess uh, a pilot had smoked Lucky Strike cigarettes and took the cigarette packet out, finished the last one, and bought it up, threw it out the window, and it landed in the jungle. And then when they came in to, to do the excavation there at Altoon Ha, they found a Lucky Strike cigarette uh, thing, wrapper. I said, oh, that's a good name for the town is Lucky Strike. <laughs> and so, but it was just a, a jungle, and so they they hollowed that out, and it's a, it's a neat little village there now. And I was able to go back in 2019 and and help rebuild the church down there in 2000. So they, now there's a Lucky Strike. Is it a Lucky Strike Assembly of God? Is it the name of the Lucky church? Strike Assembly of God? And yeah, so you have a Assembly of God church named after a cigarette package. <laughs> I think that's such a neat story. And then um, um, we met a lady, I think she was at that church. I could be wrong because it's, it's been a few years now. But um, he had, um, I guess she was pregnant on the way trying to get to town or something. You remember that yeah. story? Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, my mother's name is Nelma. And... Um, 
my parents were going from Lucky Strike back into Belize City where we lived, and uh, there was a, a lady there who's who's uh, who's who's great with child, and, and uh, I guess she needed to get to the doctor really quick. She's having complications with her pregnancy, and, and uh, I don't know if maybe it was breach or whatever. Uh, but anyway, they had to put her in the back of that English Land Rover, that old big boxy truck, uh, 12 seater. And, uh, I guess I had to be there too. Was, I guess they just slid her in the back of that Land Rover and took her into Belize city. And, uh, on the way there, she's, she's really struggling, but she said, if my baby comes out healthy, if it's a boy, I'm going to name it Tommy after you, or it's a girl, I'm going to name it Nelma after, after you, sister Carpenter. And, because you're helping me in my time of need. And so Nelma is still in that village. And, and then she has a daughter, a granddaughter, I think named Nelma as well. Uh, and so I'm friends with both of them on, on Facebook. So to say, I think we took a picture with them that on yeah. that trip. And so, uh, actually, uh, Nelma, uh, the first Nelma was, uh, the granddaughter of sister Ann Jones, who is, uh, one of the most amazing ladies that I've ever met because such faith that she had, uh, she was a, she was a, a, a black lady that, that, that talked with a very strong British accent and like most of the uh, Belizeans down there did. Uh, and, uh, but what a woman of faith she was. There are two things that I remember about her. One time she was, bitten by a very poisonous snake, the fertile ants. They call it the yellow jawed tomagoff. And, um, I mean, it's, it's one of the bad news. If you get bit by that 10 second snake, I mean, it's like you get mm. bit, you're going to die. I mean, you, you, you won't have time to get antivenom get into you because it's very, very poisonous snake. And she got bitten by one and she was taken directly to her hut and people gathered around. They started building her coffin. You know, they knew, uh, whatever. The next morning she gets up, she walks out just like Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, she started fixing breakfast for everybody. No swelling, nothing. And yet, you know, they killed the snake. They knew what it was. They saw that the, the fang marks in her leg. So it wasn't just a snap and, you know, it, it was two deep injections and, and the Lord just healed her because she and her family were just praying people. And another occasion, um, they came to a flooded river and she was with us and, and she was going to preach one service. <laughs> my, my dad was going to preach another. And, and I remember this, um, I was three years old, but I remember this, this river and basically they had two planks across this flooded river. I mean, it was, you had to keep your wheels exactly straight. Uh, and you could feel the, the give of those planks. And, uh, so we're praying about it and, and mom and dad are like, Oh, what do we do? Cause this, this is a swollen river and it's, it's going through there quick. And sister Jones said, go true, brother, Carpenter. go true, go true. And that was a confidence that my parents had to hear because here was an older lady who was a prayer warrior. She had heard from God, get on that little bridge and you go across because the Lord's going to protect you. And dad got on that bridge, went all the way across. We preached at that village. I don't know who got saved or if anybody got saved or whatever the case was, but they were able to go across the bridge, do their service and come back across the bridge because sister Jones had heard the word of the Lord go through go through and uh, such a woman of faith you just so she was she was a hero of mine her sons she had six sons uh but the two teenage boys i was a three-year-old four-year-old uh they were like 10 and 12 so they were my heroes those are guys i looked up to sammy and paul you know i want to be like them uh but uh such a such a great family and uh but it, it all stemmed from sister ann jones was was there at Lucky Strike, and that was that was her uh, church that she pastored uh, for years, and so it was such a such a wonderful experience there. Yeah, but it was always 
an adventure to be had on the missions field with Jesus. That's for sure. Oh yeah. And then, um, your, your parents were missionaries and, and you're missionaries and your, your brother's a pastor, but he's, he's actually in Belize right now while we're recording this. Yeah. And, um, doing missions work and, and your kids are doing missions work home and abroad and, you know, such a cool legacy to be a part of that. That's so true. Um, both of my daughters, um, our missionaries, one's in uh, the country of Kyrgyzstan, which is 12 times on the way. We don't get to see them very much. And, and thank the Lord for Marco Polos and Zoom, FaceTime. But yes, you know, we get to at least see our kids. But uh, when we were on the mission field, it was by letter or by ham radio that we communicated with my grandparents. And so uh, I'm, I'm thankful that my grandkids get to know their grandparents to us. Uh, more than I got to know my grandparents initially. So that's that's a blessing. And then uh, my other daughter, she's a she's a U.S. missionary and works over in Tennessee. You know, they need some missionaries over there in Tennessee. <laughs> they're, they're lost and backwards people, I'll just say it. <laughs> well, better be careful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that one. <laughs> but, yeah. But anyway, I think you went with us to a Tennessee football game uh, uh-huh. one time, sat next to us at the ball game, and, and we sat next to the people who really needed Jesus, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people, uh, yeah, get into a little bit of a different yeah. uh, mindset. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it a nice way of putting it there. Yeah, so anyway, uh, but she's doing a great job over there, too. And then, uh, of course, Chad is is uh, involved in, in ministry work. I, uh, my dad left a a legacy of missions to all of his kids. And, and my sister, she's done missions work. And she and her husband have, have been to Ireland many times and done missions work over there. And, and uh, they have uh, all sorts of things they're doing uh, internationally with their church. They've been to so many countries doing missions work. Uh, it's a awesome, uh, just legacy to be a part of. And, and it's, it's an honor just to, know your family and and uh, get to be kind of you know friends and just be a part of whatever I can be with you guys and and uh I think what you're doing uh, with special needs and all that is just not only cool and neat and interesting but it's so needed yeah and so I hope people listening to this today maybe their eyes will be open a little bit and and uh obviously everybody you come across um their eyes are going to be open and uh, get to be a part of what you're doing. Um, if if they want, if they're listening to this or seeing this uh, clip on YouTube or wherever, um, they want to get to know more about your ministry or get in contact with you or maybe have you come speak or or be a part of what you're doing. Um, how how would they get in touch with you or or find out more about your ministry? Well, uh, you can call our office. It's Compassion Link. Our office number is four one seven eight six 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 three one one or you can uh go to t carpenter at compassionlink.org or if you really want to get in touch with us go to my wife's email which is a carpenter at compassionlink.org and it's all one word c-o-m-p-a-s-s-i-o-n-l-i-n-k.org a carpenter and so we can just get you all set up and, and uh, we'd love to come to your churches we'd love to just sit down and have coffees with you uh, because you can tell, you get me started on missionary stories, I'll keep you a long time. Uh, yeah, you can tell me to shut up any time, uh, but uh, it, it is a passion for us that we want people to know that there is a very special group of people out there who Jesus loves, that He is wanting to reach, and so that's who we are. Compassion Link. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and and joining the Mission Field Media Podcast. And uh, I'm sure we'll be on the mission field again together sometime. Hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks again for joining us on the Mission Field Media Podcast. We so appreciate you taking the time to watch and listen to what God is doing all around the world through all these missionaries and ministries. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and find us on the social media apps and follow us there as well. Tell all your friends about it. We couldn't do any of this without the listeners like yourself and our sponsors. Thank you so much, and we look forward to having you join us again on the Mission Field Media Podcast.